Yes. Um, sure. Um, you mentioned that there were neuroanatomical markers during the first and second trimester of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. How does that sound? And how does that measure? Is that measured? Well, um, you might be able to find it by an ultrasound. You know, it's, uh, so you're in, in a pregnancy, that can be found. Um, when it comes from uh, studying it in the actual individual who's presenting with autism and recognizing it, you know, there are you know, fairly um, standard imaging approaches that are used by physicians in the field. Uh, you know, cranial um, CT scans is, is one. Um, that includes some of the more bony changes that occur in the skull or cranial MRI exam. And we're starting to see that there are certain regions of the brain. And one of the experts who've looked at this in the past, if you're interested, is a woman by the name of Martha Herbert, or, who who's in Boston, I believe, and she actually helped valid, uh, you know, validate the approach that we looked at with the 3D imaging, where you've seen this more typical, um, generally in, in individuals without autism, a left side asymmetry, she showed the same thing when she did brain, uh, brain MRI images, parcelated different anatomical regions of the brain, and saw that individuals in autism, that this prefrontal cortex area was disproportionately more enlarged in those MRI studies than what you might see. There are other changes as well, too, where you might see reduced size of what's called the cerebellum or the back of the brain, which is where we um, focus skills such as coordination and balance and those kinds of things, hand-eye coordination. Uh, and you can see some of those challenges sometimes in individuals with autism. It's hard to know exactly how often we can, um, you know, the cerebellum is impacted in those cases because we don't routinely do MRIs in every child. We generally limit and any kind of brain imaging to those where we think there might be other neurological sequelae because it is an invasive procedure. So it's not one that's on the, the regular uh, approach to testing. But that is through imaging like that, either in the individual or ultimately from prenatal ultrasound scans that can get a pretty good look. And we even have 3D MRIs and things like that as well. But, you know, I don't think any one of those things would be really helpful in terms of it might predict risk, but it's not going to tell you what you see until we get a better understanding of the genetics of, of some of that or gen gene environment. What, what's the mean age of the they go, uh, I mean, we, we do the whole family. Um, the individuals that we look at being a pediatric kind of referral center is largely those who are 19 years of age and, and, and under. Um, I, don't, I don't actually know the average age now that we've continued these studies, but at the time there, um, it varied from children who are about, I'd say, three years of age at the very youngest, at the most two teenage years, and average and around early child, uh, you know, childhood. Eight, eight to ten. No, no, not really. It doesn't change that much. I mean, you can still see when you looked at that that discriminant analysis, you know, the subplots of the mean um, control faces versus those with autism, they still discreetly were different in terms of the size differences regardless of whether they were young age or old age, right? There, It was more sort of discrete plots that way. There was very little areas of overlap. Can, can you imagine that eventually that technology could be used for early diagnosis. Yeah, well, some have I taken mean, it on, like the Autism Treatment Network in the in the states. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, and I know that some of the centers there, where clinical genetics has been increasingly playing a role. I know Judith Miles is continuing it there. Her center are doing it mm -hmm. to try and and continue some of that testing. For me, I never approached that, nor any of us. In that, in that group that published it. We never approached it from that perspective, mm -hmm. but boy, do we ever get targeted for, for its usefulness in that area. Mm -hmm. Everyone wanted to see it as, as a tool, but we didn't have the final piece of evidence, and we're still working on that to get enough numbers and enough evidence of people showing that atypical asymmetry that mm -hmm. we can meaningfully subgroup it and stratify it with the genetics that contribute to it. It's certainly, though, an area that if we find it, it's an important component of those 30 or 32 features that we've seen in our cluster analysis, for sure. And I think that's where it better fits, is one of several um, features. You know, just kind of like the ADOS ADIR takes important features from the psychometric perspective, from the physical features. It's not going to be just one. It's not going to be as simple as that. It's going to be this cluster patterning that we see. And we might see it again in a certain cohort <coughs> or subgroup of individuals where it might be more prescriptive.
Yeah, but it is being targeted for that, and there are businesses actually <coughs> in the states there's wanting such, to. Yeah. There's such a push now. Yeah. For <coughs> stable, valid early diagnostic yeah. measures. Yeah. Yeah. Army Clins yeah. work with the eye. Yeah. 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 Exactly. You know, other yeah. kinds of things because we yeah. know yeah. we can't get them if we get them early. The yeah. Outcomes are so much. Yeah, and we were the first to publish that work. <laughs> I mean, it really was a seminal study, and since then, you know, now you see at Infar meetings, you know, the 3D MD people and all those guys there. That evolved from that particular work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Abs yes, you can. And, and Peter Hammond's work in that area, together with people here in Canada, Judith Allenson and others who have, have helped him evolve that, uh, Rural Hennecam, there's been a lot of people who have looked at that in differentiating discrete syndromes, mm -hmm. and it's very useful for it. Uh, you know, they've looked at it for Wolf Hirschhorn syndrome, they've looked at it for Williams, they've looked at it for Noonan syndrome, all kinds of different syndromes to get sort of a, you could almost measure like a, a craniofacial variability index, so to speak, that's typical the different syndromes, and, you, and by having a digital data, you can reference it to norms that can be measured as well, too, because we have population control samples. Uh, you can still do the same thing with the anthropometry, too, and look at things more quantitatively and objectively, like through z-scores, and, and z-score measures culminating in these craniofacial variability indexes. It's an area of work that we really need to explore and, and apply um, more on a, on a larger scale. So, would, would you see you know, on the horizon that that would be accessible here? Um, I mean, I just, I just think, I mean, with Pat, mm -hmm. we could do these identifications earlier, and mm -hmm. I'm happy we have tools like the ADOS. And yeah. But I also just think, gosh, we just spend so much time doing mm -hmm. all of this. Mm -hmm. I'm a psychologist. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah. like, yeah, I want to know what's going on so I can get the intervening. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, are you thinking, are, you know, is that a few years away? Do you think we're yeah, no, away? no, I mean, I don't think it's, that too will be important. And, and I think one of the biggest advances we could make was having greater genetics, clinical genetics involvement with the individuals who are being seen for autism diagnoses. Um, you know, in a way, you know, I don't think it should be just limited to autism. We know I. ID overlaps with autism. We know in kids that have other mental health challenges it overlaps. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, children who have neurodevelopmental disabilities in general value or can benefit from the, what clinical geneticists give to the, to the picture. Because, you know, we, we can recognize some of these discrete syndromes or genetic influences that might, I, hopefully identify at least some of the rare, more penetrant alleles that can give you a better predictive value of autism earlier, or signatures, if we start putting those together from genome sequencing, that, yeah, we can start putting together tests. There are genetic tests out there right now looking at some of these single nucleotide polymorphisms called SNPs, taking them from variants, putting them on a panel. You look at Integrogen or there's other ones evolving Syngap diagnosis. There are actually panels out there now claiming that they can pick up autism in about 80% of cases, right? Um, now, and where they're applying that is to infants at risk on the basis of a positive family history. That's great. I think that's helpful. But, you know, as, as a clinical geneticist that's sitting there and they're communicating to these families, and as a pediatrician, families don't just want to know whether their child is, has autism or is at risk for it. They want to know what it means to that, their individual child. And they want to know whether my child is going to be able to, you know, integrate within a, a you know, normally within a school setting. What kind of social challenges are they going to have? Are they going to have epilepsy? What is their cognitive and adaptive status going to be? That's where we need to link, actually, more importantly, to the function aspects of the assessment and and um, develop templates for that and um, it's evolving but to do it right and to do it well it's going to take time to do this kind of phenomenal well, work. Those of us who mm -hmm. do intervention, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, to be able to know on the front end, okay, yeah. Yeah. here are the, I mean this is a kid yeah. who's very likely to have an oral motor apraxia, yeah. for example. Exactly. So, or know, is it developmental just, coordination yeah, disorder? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> that is one of my key examples that I yeah. give is in those kids with, with verbal apraxia and who just, you know, they're, they're not going to have that same expressive language ability as other kids. So what can you do to augment their nonverbal skills? This is the piece that helps you get over that hump. Yeah. That you're yeah. When you're and, and, and you know, too, yeah. Yeah. You know that there are those kids that you just, they don't respond as well as what well, you'd or, expect I mean, to. Ideally, mm -hmm. you know, here's, here's this kid's profile, yeah. and here's the treatment of the yeah. intervention yeah. emphasis yeah. that needs to be yeah. enacted yeah. so that you can take yeah. advantages of, of his strengths yeah. and not constantly yeah. be being and, an and that's the, against the brick wall yeah. of what are I agree with you. Organic and that, that's the part that gets me up and out of bed every day, actually. It's not me sort of much targeting the genes and getting them in science and nature and all that kind of stuff. You know, there are genomic experts who are better at that and have more resources and means for, for doing that, to find what those genetic contributors are. But if you're still only going to relate to it as a, in a unidimensional kind of view as a risk for autism, that's not helping anybody. you got to know what that is in that child, in that particular case, and what is best suited for that child across lifespan. We really need to develop more personalized approaches for autism and stratifying the genetics as a, as a tool, but it has to be linked with what we know about phenotyping and phenomics too. So this is why it's taken 12 years of collecting all of this data to get to a point where we can really do that. And on that note, yeah. <laughs> thank you.